everyone. Welcome to Ham Talk. My name is Sam Henley, KE0LMY. This is Greg. Hello, everybody. Uh, Greg N5XL. This is Melissa. Hi, everybody. Melissa, KI5ICQ. And later on, you'll even get to hear from my daughter, who's one of our special guests this week. Her name is Renee, KE0LMZ. We also have a super secret special guest that Greg has brought on for the very first show. And I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, it was a fun uh, chase to get the uh, interview set up and everything. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I think it's going to be kind of an interesting twist for the, uh, for the show this week. Plus, uh, we've got uh, a nice uh, interview and uh, tour of uh, uh, Andrea's uh, amateur radio rover for uh, VHF UHF. So uh, I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, she has uh, been roving for quite a few years and puts a lot into it. Excellent. So everybody get ready, hang in there with us as we work through a bunch of our little quirks and issues and hopefully you'll be entertained and you'll wanna come back for more. So without further ado, here we go with the show. <laughs> I bet we have a lot of quirks and, and, and problems. <laughs> we go. We're already discussing a blooper reel, so you guys look forward to that at the end of 2021. <laughs> All right, I'm here with uh, Andrea uh, K2EZ, who uh, is a uh, big time VHF UHF rover. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Andrea. Thanks, Greg, for having me on. You're welcome, and we appreciate you joining us here to help us out. So can you tell us a little bit about what roving is and uh, exactly how it works and uh, what's involved with it? Okay, well, roving refers specifically to one category in the VHF contest, VHF, UHF contests, uh, even extending into the microwaves. And a rover, very simply, is a station that moves from one grid to another grid during the course of the contest. So most of the stations on our, in the contest are fixed. So as you can imagine, given the generally limited ranges you get on, on VHF and UHF, it can get kind of tough to find new stations by the end of the contest. Um, there are certainly band openings that occur, and a lot of people don't understand um, how the band openings work in VHF and how you can get much further than line of sight. But as a rover, during the course of the contest, I'll go on a hilltop as an example, and then I'll um, work all the stations I can, then I'll run over to another grid. And as soon as I trains, change grids, I am a fresh station that contest operators can work. And so for the course of the contest, I'm always someone fresh that people can contact. Um, as a rover, I have to transport all my equipment and my antennas in my vehicle. And um, uh, often uh, one of the values rovers provide is some ongoing activity, but also activating a grid that may not have a fixed station operator in it. Uh, so that is something that is very valuable to uh, the operators in, in the contest. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, I thought that I was fanatical about uh, VHF, UHF until I saw your rover for the first time about five or six years ago. And uh, I'm gonna say you, you set the bar very high. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, I didn't think you could operate some of the bands that you're operating on uh, from a mobile like that. Uh, what what originally attracted you to roving? I mean, you know, that that's kind of a an extreme sport of this sport. Well, I, I often say I'm, I kind of fell into it accidentally. I've I've been an amateur radio operator for 40 years now, and um, never really even did weak signal VHF, UHF, certainly had not even given microwaves a thought. They weren't even on the horizon. I knew something about two meters, sideband and better performance and stuff. And uh, 
but I didn't mess with it other than some dabbling with um, satellites back in the 90s. And uh, so I fell into it accidentally. I was going on a road trip. Uh, my first real long distance road trip, I, I'd been out to basically east of the Mississippi. Um, and I, my, I was going to visit my daughter in Utah, and I had planned a trip to visit friends in Minnesota all along. And, and so I had HF set up in the car, and I heard this VHF contest was going on. And I'm like, well, it's easier to make VHF contests, uh, contacts, excuse me, than HF contacts from the mobile. And so I had this radio from satellite days, which gave me two meters, one and a quarter meters. I had a, another rig that gave me 70 centimeters and my HF rig did six meters. And I'm like, well, there's four bands that are in the contest. Um, let me put this rig in the car and, and add it in there. And I just made some little horizontal dipole antennas and uh, decided, okay, I better look at the rules, make sure this is operating mobile is legal in the contest. And I start looking through and I discovered this rover category and specifically a limited rover, which is low power, four bands. And I said, perfect, I've got four bands. And so I understood, you know, the grids and and so I looked at my route and I'm like okay I can adjust it here to hit a couple more grids and well I'll just do this during the contest and um the first day was a total disaster I didn't know what I was doing uh I had a hard time making contacts I wasn't copying very well I mean I had 25 watts I did have horizontally polarized antennas which I knew was important but they were just dipoles um, and six meters was vertically polarized. I used my Tar Heel for that. And, uh, but at one stop I was, there was a bunch of ignition noise stuff. I'm like, this thing has to have a noise blanker. I couldn't find it on this I, um, FT736, which has a million buttons. And so I finally got out a flashlight because I couldn't see it in the car otherwise. And I found the noise blanker and I hit, I pushed that and suddenly I could hear people like 10 times better. And from then the contest got better. I had my first four band sweep because when you make contact on with one station, typically six meters or two meters, you QSY through the rest of your bands. And so people would say, you know, do you have any other bands? And that's kind of a staple question if you haven't worked somebody before. What other bands have you got? And uh, so I had my first four band run. And uh, the next day I started out in the snow, but there was a whole bunch of activity in the morning. So I'm operating while driving in the snow. And I found people were starting to follow me. When, when do you get a new grid? And suddenly they were all interested in this. And um, I was like, well, this, this is great. You know, it was a lot of attention. I just had a lot of fun. I only worked like 78 contacts in that contest, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to do this again when June comes around. That, that was the uh, January contest. June is actually the biggest contest of the year. And while I'm saying it, September is the, the third major contest. There's a number of sprints um, plus the uh, CQ worldwide, which is mostly a six meter contest, but has two meters as well. Yeah, you know, you say that. Uh, I have never had luck during the September contest out of this location. Uh, June, I have, I've, I've come in first place a couple times, and uh, the January one, I don't do too bad, but uh, September, I don't know why. I've just I don't ever have any luck with that uh, that contest. On, on on some of the contests and stuff, what are some of the what what kind of your average number of uh, contacts? Well, it's it it certainly has grown, and um, to put a perspective on that, uh, limited rover, I 
typically was getting about 300 contacts, 270 to 300 contacts through a number of contests. And that was enough to get me well within the top 10. Uh, multipliers uh, play a role. And of course, the different grids you go to are multipliers. For my really good efforts, the ones that I actually got first place in Limited Rover, I was right around 500 cues for the whole contest. Um, certainly not like an HF contest where you're, you're churning out, you know, multiple contacts a minute. You might get a few contacts like that, QSYing with a station, but uh, those occurrences are pretty rare. Uh, as I've gotten into classic rover, classic rover is all the bands up into the microwaves. I'm getting about 500 cues now. That's not bad. Excuse me, I said 500 again, didn't I? I meant 800 cues. Yeah, that's that's pretty healthy uh, performance and stuff. I think uh, I think my best contest was about 712 here at the house, and uh, yeah. on there. So you know, uh, and interesting enough, that was 2009. Wow, uh, was the best one, and it was my second contest. So, uh, what was some of the uh, <laughs> Besides the obvious, uh, when people see your antennas and everything, but what are some of the uh, major obstacles you ran into, both in actually roving and in uh, building your rover? Well, the the rover I've been build, building, uh, 2015 was that first contact uh, contest, excuse me, and uh, in June was the first time I started using this this vehicle. So it's been just a about five years and it's been a progression of steps along the way starting out with omnis and then stacking omnis um, horizontal loops and then eventually adding the yaggies on there but i think one of the first obstacles i encountered um, was getting people to know i was out there i didn't have a lot of power and it does help for stations to know that that you're out in the area it's not absolutely necessary but it really does help um, another one that i encountered the first several contests is it took me a while to sort it out was logging how to log that first contact i was using a paper log and and it was tough to log and then the pros contest operation was just terribly time consuming. And that was with 78 contacts. Um, software for computer um, is fine when sitting down, but the software uh, always wanted to log the last band you log something on because they are all designed for contest of running continuous on one frequency. But in the VHF contacts, contests, you're hopping up and down the bands. And so, almost no two contact in a row is on the same band. And, it, and the number of errors I made was just crazy. Um, and then trying to log, the, you know, having to pull on this, you know, fit when you're sitting still, you're fine. But if you're moving and you log somebody, then suddenly you're pulling off to the side of the road. So I ended up writing my own software to get around that. Um, ergonomics, that was not a, great big it was a challenge because i had to think things out as the system got more complex i had to make sure that i could operate and not affect you know my ability to drive and pay attention on the road i gotta tell you i have to pay a lot of attention to the road because the way people react to to the rover and um i they drive erratically pictures and and hiding in my blind spots to to check out the vehicle and uh, so I have to have to be up on that uh, RFI was another one you've got a lot of equipment and antennas in a small area um, the rigs at the power levels I was running didn't really I mean they overloaded each other and except for two six meter rigs and antennas that were about a foot apart where I blew out the finals on one rig with transmitting by the other. Um, I never had a problem with that, but 
um, RF would get back into the cables between the rigs when I had amplifiers into that switch, the key up of the amplifier. Um, trying to use an RF sensed amplifier, you transmit on, on two meters and the two meter RF goes down the 70 centimeter antenna through the amp and triggers the RF sensing circuit. So the amp's going click, 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 because once it clicks, it loses the connection. It drives you patty. And so I had, a, I had to overcome that. And as the system grew, I eventually ran into this problem of, well, I wanted to add the Yaggies, but I had the Omnis that were serving me so well in the back. back. And so how am I going to mount the Yaggies, provide all the structure, be able to rotate these while on the move, because that was a design choice that I made, be able to withstand um, my design goal of 125 mile per hour wind, because some parts of the country, like Wyoming specifically, where I'd been, you have an 80 mile an hour speed limit and you get some headwinds and stuff. So I needed to get all that mounted. And then I needed to be able to switch between the Yaggies and the Omnis. So making all that antenna switching, um, that was one of the, the challenges. Um, I could also add going into the microwaves. I had to think, well, how can I do feed lines at these frequencies and so on. But uh, there's, there's lots of technical challenges for sure. But the basic limited rover, not that hard to get into. Well, on your station, the biggest fear I would have is trees. <laughs> I, uh... Yeah, watching out for trees, um, that is the biggest thing. I've had my uh, two meter Yagi, which is at the top, get fishboned a few times. Um, it's usually after rain, it's in the spring where the leaves are hanging lower uh, before tr trucks have brushed them, them off. And after a rainstorm, that's where I have to watch the most. I've got a pretty good calibrated eye, but sometimes in the dark, you know, you watch out. I did take out a cable TV cable, cable once that was hung low across the road. Everything's supposed to be above 14 feet. This one was somewhere around 11 feet and it, it hit the mast. Didn't do any damage, but it, it, it kind of knocked the Yagi catawampus on me and I had to bend things and get it back. Yeah, I bet. I, uh, I have taken out more, uh, of my, I run the uh, K5VH Omnis uh, on my truck and neighborhood trees and trees up at the ranch have more than once taken out my, my uh, Omni antenna on there. They don't have the flex like a whip does on that. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, uh, what, what's probably the longest travel distance you've done on a roving trip during a contest? The, the longest uh, single contest was my January 2016. So it was fairly early and it was after quite a bit of upgrades. I was still just running the Omnis. And that was a 1700 mile row starting central Pennsylvania, um, uh, going up towards the Great Lakes, picking up a little bit of New York, across Ohio, out to Dayton. A uh, little jog north to catch a grid in Dayton, then run down through um, Ohio into Kentucky, then Tennessee, uh, into Arkansas, and then into Texas, where I didn't take the shortest route to my destination because I wanted to get to the DFW Metroplex, and then from there, uh, finishing the, the contest right on the outskirts of Houston. It was total activation of 27 grids uh, in that contest. And that actually set a record for the most number of grids in a submitted log. I've heard rumors of 30 plus grids, but not they weren't in a log that ever got submitted. Um, and that was about 29 hours of operating time with about four hours um, downtime for sleep. Wow. 
uh, more power to you. I, I have enough trouble doing the contest right here in the shack. So I, uh, I, I don't think, no, it would be fun to do the roving, uh, but uh, uh, I think it takes a special kind of person to go after that. Why don't you uh, give us a tour of uh, your ham shack and stuff? I know you've got some prepared pictures for us. And uh, let's go ahead and, and kind of review those and go over them. Okay, sure. The first photo here is an annotated version of Rover uh, showing all the antennas marked. Um, the seven Yaggies on the front of Rover and the Rover I use as a, a proper pronoun for the vehicle ever since I hung the signs that say Rover on the side. Um, in the center, I have my HF antenna and outside contests. I do quite a bit of HF operation. Almost invisible, but marked there are a bunch of vertical whips, including a CB antenna. And then on the rear mast is the horizontal loops for uh, six meters at the top, they're stacked two meters, stacked one and a quarter meters. And then I've got two loops that are kind of standing on end. They're semi-directional for 70 centimeters. And they gave, one gives me a front rear pattern, one gives me a broadside pattern. That is something unique. A lot of people ask me questions about. Yeah, I always wondered kind of why you had a couple antennas uh, set up uh, basically on end like that. I found that um, th that loop is so quote unquote a dual band loop, and and it's supposed to work for two meters and seventy centimeters. I had one originally sitting normally in the horizontal plane for two meters and one for seventy centimeters. I called up the manufacturer one day and asked, well, what's the gain on 70 centimeters? Because it's bigger than a, a, a natural 70 centimeter loop because it was a two meter loop used on the third harmonic. And they said, we don't know. It just tunes up okay. And I'm like, okay. So I did some analysis I, I would expect because it was bigger that there's more capture area and it would exhibit some gain. What I discovered was that on 70 centimeter, it was essentially shooting all the energy straight up. And I'm like, that's not good. And then I sort of played around with it. And I said, what if I put it on its side? And uh, what I came to learn is that that large loop behaves much more like a full wave loop than a half wave loop. A full wave loop radiates perpendicular to the plane of the loop. Uh, to a large extent, whereas a uh, half wave loop favors in the plane of the loop. And so these, I, I stood them on end, looked at what the analysis said, and it said I should get some gain. It's about 120 dB, excuse me, not 120 dB, 120 degree, 3 dB down beam width, which means with one facing front rear, another side to side, there's quite a bit of overlap. And at, on the 45s, they'll perform about the same. And they're only about a dB or so down from, from the peak. And when I'm solidly in one versus the other, um, it's about 6S units difference I can have between the two antennas if somebody's in, in the null on one of them. And uh, it was a sem semi, I think of it as a semi-omni solution because there were just two switch positions. I flipped back and forth. If one worked, I'd stick with it. If it didn't, I switched the other. That simple. Okay, well, you answered my question, not, so I don't need to answer my next question. <laughs> I was going to ask <laughs> you if you had those phased or was switching them back and forth. Right, switched. This next photo here is of the front seat, actually looking at the center console and the passenger side. As you can see, there's no room for a passenger. 
And in the center console, you've got my FT450, which is my HF and my six meter rig. Immediately to the right of the FT450 and a little bit down, you'll see the control head of an IC7000. I use that almost exclusively on 70 centimeters. It is my backup two meter and my backup HF and my backup six meter rig. Uh, above that IC7000 is the venerable FT736 that I had gotten back in the 90s. Oh my God, how long ago that was. Uh, brand new. And that's my primary contest two meter rig and one and a quarter meter rig. Uh, above that, you see a monitor which is mounted to the dashboard, which is my console for flex radio, which is in the back seat. And with that flex radio, I use for, I can use it on six meters, I can use it on two meters, but pretty much only use that for digital modes. I haven't done a whole lot of digital modes, but that lets me do digital modes without the RF getting into all the interconnect wires. Um, I do use the flex radio predominantly for the microwave bands where the pan adapter helps me find other stations. Um, frequency accuracy on the micro microwave bands is very poor in general. Uh, unless you GPS lock it. And uh, even if you're locked, there's no guarantee the other station will be locked. So uh, I use that very much on the microwaves and it helps a whole lot. Uh, not really seen here. Uh, well, just above the FT450 on top of it is Morse code key that I got from my grandfather. He was never an amateur radio operator. He wanted to be but he had a tin ear and could never pass the code. Um, that key dates back to the 30s and probably my most precious thing I've got in the vehicle, to be honest. Um, it, it works well and I keep telling myself I should find another key for the car. Uh, and just above the key, kind of down by the consoles is an old IC900 that's got four bands six meters through 70 centimeters and that's FM only and I'll I'll have that on and off during contests so I can listen on you know 5-2, 223 5, 4 um, not so much six meters but uh, be, because most people on six meters also I tend to be HF plus six meter rigs so they have sideband whereas a lot of people on, on some of the other bands don't necessarily have sideband. This next photo is of the back seat and shows the, what I call the flex deck, which is the one that's hanging on the back of the seat. Um, and the, the big black box is the flex radio. Next to it is a two meter LDPA. Um, the flex radio supports two meters natively. It's uh, flex 6700, uh, but only low power. So that little amplifier is needed to bring that up to 70 watts. There's a switching network to the left of that and a couple RF switches below that let, that let me select different two, six meter rigs and different two meter rigs. In the horizontal level you see there, those are my transverters. On the far left is um, the 23 centimeter. And then I have a speaker, a little switch that lets me select between the transverters. And then I have one for 13 centimeters, nine centimeters. And then on the right hand side, one for 33 centimeters. This next photo here is, you, you see the transverters on the upper deck, the lower deck, which is quite a bit older in terms of the evolution of the vehicle, has my amplifiers, which include a 90 watt amplifier for 70 centimeters, a 
100 watt amplifier for one and a quarter meters and 160 watt amplifier for two meters. Also on that same level, but not visible is the RF deck for that IC7000. This photo here is interesting. It shows some of the construction of the rotator assembly, mast, uh, thrust bearing, and supports for the thrust bearing that take the wind load and transfer that back to the uh, roof rack of the vehicle. I have seven Yaggies mounted. I, got, I had to count them real quick mentally. Yes, the seven Yaggies, two meters, one and a quarter, 70 centimeters, 23 centimeters, 33 centimeters, 13 centimeters, and nine centimeters. Um, and just for reference, 33 centimeters is 902 megahertz, 23 is 1296 megahertz, 13 centimeters is 2304 megahertz, and nine centimeters is 3456 megahertz. One thing about this installation that isn't obvious to the casual observer is that from outside the vehicle, they're mounted to the front almost all rovers that you see will either mount them like the Yaggies off the bed of a truck or off the trailer hitch. But I already had working antennas there, so I was kind of stuck. Well, what am I gonna do with these Yaggies? I'm gonna have to mount them in this more difficult to place location. So I, I did this and I had a side of that, uh, side benefit I did not expect which is that from the driver's seat where this picture is taken, I just had to look up and I knew which way my Yaggies were pointed. So even though I have the rotator controller down on my right hand side um, next to the console, I don't ever look at that controller unless I'm stopped and, and I'm kind of playing around that I know a station's at a certain location. But on the move, it's like a quick glance up, like looking at the speedometer or something, you know, which way is it pointing? And I usually have some idea it, what direction I'm heading on the road. It's a highway, very rough idea, but then I'll know some certain stations are either mostly to the north or to the east or, or whatever. And I just kind of crank in and I say, okay, it's gotta be to the left of me a little bit and I swing it around there. The Yagi has a very fast rotation rate. Uh, I can go from 180 degrees in 20 seconds. So um, I, can, I can search pretty well with that. This photo shows the cable bundle running up to the rotator, uh, seven coaxes, plus the rotator cable is in there. Most of those coaxes LMR 400. There is one length of um, Belden 9913 and there's two runs of MNP Hyperflex, which I use for the 2304 megahertz and the 3456 megahertz. That stuff is quite a bit thicker diameter um, it's very similar to LMR 600, and that's what I needed to get the losses low enough. With regard to the coax, uh, one day looking at these bundles, I got to wondering how much coax do I have in this vehicle? So I started adding it up, and the total as it stands currently is 535 feet of coax in the vehicle. This photo shows the coax switching network and the control box. The switching network is some N type relays. I think there's five of them or six of them. Some of them are cascaded and the output from the radio goes to these um, relays. And I 
from in front of the car, I can select whether I want the Omni or the Yagi. And this lets me handle a lot of that front rear switching that I mentioned was a, a challenge. Um, on the two meter antenna, I have selections or two meter rig, I should say, I have selections of the Yagi in the front, the stack loops on the rear mast, or a vertical dipole that I have off the side of the rear mast. And I use that vertical dipole far more than I use the 5 8 wave vertical on the roof, mostly because it's higher up and experience shows it works a little bit better. And so that's the one I have hooked up to the contest rig that's got the amps and everything. Power for all the amplifiers and the radios can be quite a bit of challenge. And this photo here shows where I've located a secondary battery in the back seat of the car close to the, the radios. I have four gauge wire running from this battery to the battery at the front of the vehicle. And I have a charge controller. Under normal conditions, I usually isolate the batteries and the charge controller limits the charge going to this secondary battery to about 20 amps. Uh, during a contest, I'll actually bridge them both together because the 20 amps charging of this extra battery cannot keep up with the use during the contest. Uh, the output of the charge controller actually diode ores the two batteries together. And when I draw high current peaks, they mostly come from this local battery because the wire drops in that four gauge will cause uh, current from the main battery to drop down. The vehicle has a 160 amp alternator. And this means um, with this secondary battery here, I don't get those big currents reflected back to the alternator. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that is some of the most fascinating uh, uh, setup on there. Uh, uh, your 736 takes me back. That was one of my favorite rigs, and it was my first real uh, weak signal sideband uh, rig for two meters. I had uh, two of them, one with the uh, two meters and uh, 220 module in it uh, with 432, and then another one. Uh, that I used on 1296. So I would, I could do two, 220 and 432 and 1296. I love that radio. Really want to thank you for joining us today and appreciate your time. Any last minute advice for anybody wanting to get into roving? I, I think the, the best advice is trying to find out who's out there and kind of reach out to either another rover or a fixed station. Um, one of the things that has really motivated my interest is how tight-knit the community is. And I, I mean tight-knit in that they're enthusiastic, in that they're very helpful at getting other operators to co come on. Anybody who's willing to listen and operate, because you don't have that whole world to, to work people. Um, you know, they're... they're there's a set of operators that, that will look for the conditions when there's some enhancement and go trying to make those, those contacts. Um, I've made contacts for my mobile of about a thousand miles on two meters from Texas to Florida. I've, with my Omnis, I've, I've made contacts from Tennessee down into Texas. So, understanding a little bit who's out there, kind of reaching out to people. One of the things I did to help get known is I looked through the contest results at the top operators for each area that I was going through. And I looked them up on QRZ, said it, sent an email and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on roving in your area. Uh, do you have any tips or suggestions that you might offer me? Um, you know, this is who I am, this is my call, and this is what I'm operating. And I got um, stations uh, like K1RZ in Maryland. He had helped me a whole lot. Um, K5LLL in Texas. Um, K5QE in Texas. Uh, these 
people came back to me and wanted to talk on the phone and gave me lots of input. And that probably has influenced me, got me engaged a whole lot more than I otherwise would have. And, and I also have a lot of fun getting out to the VHF conferences that, that take place. There's, there's a number of them. Uh, there's a, a Northeast Weak Signal group uh, up in New England. There's um, pack rats in uh, generally Philadelphia area. They, they have a, a yearly conference. There's the Southeast VHF Society. They have a conference. Central States VHF has a conference. There's one out on the West Coast that I can't remember theirs. There's Northern Lights up in, I'm thinking Wisconsin, Minnesota area. Um, uh, there's the, well, there's, they don't hold a conference, but uh, there's the Roadrunner Microwave Group, which I think you know locally here. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I've met a lot of wonderful people that are enthusiastic about weak signal VHF. And oh, yeah. uh, I can't emphasize how much it is great to reach out to some of those you're people. right they uh they go out of their way to uh to help you out and stuff uh i met with marshall one time at his station just gave me a tour of the station his antenna towers and i think we spent three four hours uh pushing all the benefits of vhf uhf contest that's a man who is dedicated <laughs> and that is for sure i i, I loved his sign uh over the door of a shack with uh, real hams don't use HF <laughs> <laughs> on that. Andrea, I want to thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate your time tonight and uh, hope you have a good luck and get us your schedule and we'll get it out with the hamster events for the next contest uh, that you're doing and you're going to be uh, roving again. All right. Well, thank you very much, Greg. I appreciate it. And, and I've had a wonderful time talking with you. Thank you very and, much. Uh, and I hope the listeners enjoy it as well. Well, I hope so, and I think they will. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Sam, KE0LMY, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Amateur Radio Emergency Service. Now, most of the information about ARIES, or the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, can be found on the ARRL website, which is the Amateur Radio Relay League. The ARRL is the parent company which subsidizes or owns ARIES, and it is a group of licensed amateurs who have voluntarily registered their qualifications and equipment with their local ARIES leadership for communications duty in the public service when disaster strikes. That is what the ARRL puts out about ARIES. So now let me expound on that a little bit and let you know what we do with it in the real world. I am currently the Deputy Director of Benton County Emergency Management as well as the Assistant Director of Camden County Emergency Management. We have a tremendous amount of trust and a great working relationship with all of the amateur radio operators who come and help us during emergencies. What we do is throughout the year, we invite amateur radio operators to participate with us in tabletop exercises, full scale exercises, anything that we do that we think there should be a strong secondary communication source on. Now what happens is if primary communications go down, we ask amateur radio operators, especially out here in Benton County, because we are an extremely rural county. We do not have a lot of options. If our internet and our cell phones and our landlines go down, we have to have a backup. And specifically for Benton County, the Amateur Radio Emergency Service Group is our backup. We've written them into our local emergency operations plan, and that's why we ask them to do things like become NIMS certified. NIMS is the National Incident Management System, and it's a system that we use to make sure that it's blanket coverage. If you are trained in NIMS in one area, you can easily travel to another county and you can fall right into the way that their information and their EOC, Emergency Operations Center, 
are run and are active. So one of the best things that we get to do, and we actually just did it this year, is the simulated emergency test. The Amateur Radio Emergency Service Group, ARIES, brings their entire group out to do training, not only at the EOC, but also at various places. Here in Benton County, we have an emergency communications trailer for the county. We have access to uh, Yezu FT-991As, and these are amazing radios because they are a shack in a box. The reason why we want to make sure that we're training all of our people on the same equipment is so that if they have to work inside of the radio room here at the EOC, or we have to ask them to work out in the emergency communications trailer, they have uniform training. The ARIES members are extremely wonderful. They have all taken their independent study courses, the 100, the 200, the 700, and the 800, along with NIMS courses, 230, 235, 240, 241, 242, and 244. Uh, we ask them to do that because it brings them right into line with what we need them to do in order to work with us here at the EMA. Now, ARIES is a really unique group. Some people don't understand that ARIES groups are not clubs. They are groups. That means that they cannot own any kind of radios or equipment. They are essentially personnel who come in to operate equipment during emergency times. Now, this works out great because most small EMAs cannot keep a lot of personnel on the payroll or on the staff. We just don't have the budget for it. ARIES provides that coverage for us through their volunteers and it allows us to be able to have people who are qualified to run the communications and operations and not have to expend additional money in carrying that goal. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're going to go down through the Benton County 911 building to the radio room. We'll show you guys what kind of radios that we have in there. And then we're gonna show you the standard operating guide that we have in the room so that people know, even if they're not from our area, how they can operate while they're in our center. Now, one of the great things about having a standard operating guide or standard operating guidelines is that even if you're not from this area, you know exactly which paperwork to use and you know exactly what you're going to be doing while you're here. So come on. All right, welcome to the radio room. As you can see, we have several things up here. We've participated in numerous years simulated emergency tests. So you'll see information like, here's the call sign for Benton County, it's WB0EM. Uh, this is also the call sign that is on our repeater. Uh, we have Echolink on our repeater. The Echolink ID is WB0EM-TAC-L. So, all right, as I said, there is a operations manual, a standard operating guideline for Benton County, which we put together so that anybody who came in would know exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, now we have a script. It is used for exercises. When it is used for exercises as opposed to actual emergencies, we remind everybody, please say this is an exercise. So we put that up here a lot. So we keep an emergency script, which can be used in actual emergencies. It's also used in those exercises. We keep a copy of our incident action plan. And this has very detailed information on what the people coming into the radio room are expected to do, who they're expected to answer to, and what exactly we need. Now we also keep the actual standard operating guidelines in here because there is information contained in these that is not in the incident action plan. So we keep a copy of that in here as well. Now one of the other things that we keep in here are radiograms. 
Anybody who's been around amateur radio for a little while will recognize the radiograms. We keep the communications log in here. And then we also keep the ICS-213. And the ICS-213 is a FEMA form and it's widely used not only by ARIES but also by the American Red Cross. It's used directly by FEMA and all manners of government organizations. So, once they get through understanding everything that's in the operations manual, they are ready to sit down and operate. Now, we keep two different radios in here. Uh, this one is a Kenwood. It is a dual bander. We tend to leave this one on the 146880, which is Warrensburg, Missouri. And we keep this one over here on the 146925, which is the Benton County Aries. So, we also share this room with our CERT, our Community Emergency Response Team, and you'll find that ARIES works very tightly in rural communities with the Community Emergency Response Team. We feel that they are kind of the boots on the ground and we're their communications. Okay, so here we are back again. This is the conference room at the Benton County 911 building, in case you didn't notice. Uh, one of the things that I want to talk about now is all of the exercises and things that we do to make sure that our amateur radio emergency service people are prepared to work with those at the EMA and other served agencies. Now, the most recent thing, as I brought up earlier, is the simulated emergency test. The ARRL holds theirs on the first weekend of October every year. Now, counties can run their simulated emergency tests at different times in October. We tend to do it on the second weekend of October because that's when our meetings are, is the second Saturday of every month. We had an interesting problem this year. We originally paired with our Community Emergency Response Team, or CERT, and we tend to ask them to actually physically deploy two CERT members and an ARIES member to different places throughout our county so that we can get real-time information on how long it takes to get to different places. Now granted that is under good conditions and we understand that it's going to be longer if roads are blocked or there are any other problems during emergencies. The problem we ran into of course for 2020 is the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of the pandemic, we had to make a very difficult call, which is we didn't want a lot of our response people in the same vehicle. So my AECs, Assistant Emergency Coordinators, and I took the time to talk it over and decided that we were going to hold a completely over the air, over the radio simulated emergency test, as opposed to actually physically deploying. That was very disappointing to some of our members. We actually have a blind ham in our group who was very excited that she was going to have a chance to deploy into the field. We do what we can. Um, this pandemic has given us a lot of challenges. It's also given us a lot of opportunities to create contingency plans. Uh, the exercise this year focused on extreme flash flooding. I don't know where you are and if you know, but Missouri experienced a lot of flooding and flash flooding in 2019. Here in Benton County, we have Truman Dam, and the water level for Truman Dam got up within, I'd say, 9 or 10 feet of the top of the dam. I could be off a little bit but it caused a tremendous amount of stress on not only emergency management, but also on the Army Corps of Engineers who actually cares for the dam and our first responders because our 911, our dispatch was getting flooded, so to speak, with calls about people who were worried. So we decided that made for a perfect exercise for our simulated emergency test. 
What we figured is that if the primary lines of communication were all taken with information and communications for first responders, that we needed to have some kind of backup if we needed to establish shelters if people were being evacuated from their homes. So that would be a situation where the Benton County Emergency Management Agency would go ahead and activate Benton County Aries. Fortunately, we had some pretty amazing operators who participated in the simulated emergency test. And I'd like to take just a minute to give them a little shout out and, and recognize them for their efforts this year because it was definitely a trying time. Uh, participation included myself, KE0LMY, KF6DRH, KD0WXT, KE0LMZ, KE0YGT, K0XEP, W0YQG, KC5RQT, KE0TTL, KY0O, KE0VCR, K0PHP, and finally KD0USW. Though we canceled the physical part of our simulated emergency test, we still had 13 people participate and these weren't all in our area. Several of them were outside of our county. So I think that it is worth mentioning that the amateur radio operators in our area and outside of our area who make the effort to participate with us and train with us are absolutely the most amazing people. If you are new to this entire thing if you're if you've been in amateur radio the hobby for as long as you can remember but you want something to do that will give you something helpful and something worthwhile and contribute your skills then I recommend you get involved with your local amateur radio emergency service because they are some of the best people who are the most supportive during emergencies that you will ever meet All right, I have uh, Raisa UB1 Alpha Oscar Alpha joining us today uh, from St. Petersburg. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> hello, it's a pleasure to have you as a guest today, Raisa, and uh, I thank you very much for joining us. Greg, it's a great pleasure for me to have this uh, conversation with you today and thank you very much for your invitation to this uh, online meeting it's really great pleasure for me well thank you very much yeah i i'm going to tell you you are literally the most enthusiastic amateur radio operator i've ever met <laughs> uh, i really enjoy your videos thank uh, you very much <laughs> on that uh how uh how, how a little bit uh, did you get involved in the hobby? How, how old were you when you started and, and how did you get, get started in the hobby? Uh, I was uh, licensed on the two years ago uh, when we started our project, uh, project in Finland, uh, Oscar Hotel 73 Eco Lima Kila. It is uh, a cottage for uh, ham location with the family, uh, ham radio access with the interesting um, with uh, the family in the this uh, cottage and then the antenna was built uh, in may 2018 uh, i had my first QSO. after this uh, i um, immediately uh, started to prepare uh, my first exam uh, and uh, i passed it uh, in december uh, and since uh, since this time uh, I have been uh, in this uh, hobby and uh, I have incredible positive emotion with uh, always uh, uh, that relate to ham radio. Okay, that's, that's pretty cool on that. So what, what is your favorite aspect of the hobby? What do you enjoy most about amateur radio? So our hobby is so various uh, and uh, I like uh, many things. Uh, I like uh, work portable uh, and uh, I experienced uh, with uh, Flora and Fauna program twice uh, and once uh, with the Lighthouse program. Uh, it, it was very interesting experience for me. 
Uh, and uh, I like uh, to work uh, 20 meters bent, uh, and I'm looking forward when the sun cycle will grow uh, well, and um, uh, I can use the 20 meters and 10, uh, or, sorry, <laughs> 10 meters, meters and uh, 17. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I'm looking forward to uh, work uh, on 10 and 15 meters band. Uh, it is really very interesting bands for me, uh, but unfortunately now uh, it's not uh, so oft to possible to have the propagation on these bands. No, that's, that's good. Yeah, 20 meters and 17 meters are my favorite. Yes, and uh, also I like uh, contesting, uh, and uh, I have uh, experience with uh, uh, VPX contest uh, and uh, CQWW contest. It's a really amazing time during the contest, uh, and uh, I like it very much. So, contesting can be a lot of fun, especially mm -hmm. when you get going real fast pace. Uh, here in the United States, we've got three license classes now. They've kind of done away with everything else. We've got the uh, technician, general, and extra. How, what, what's the licensing class in Russia like? Uh, we have here four classes, uh, entry level, novice, uh, and the second uh, class, and the first class, uh, class. And the highest class is the first. And uh, I had uh, my third uh, category. Uh, I was novice, uh, and uh, recently I passed my next exam, uh, and uh, um, very soon I will get my new call. <laughs> now I am UB1 away, and uh, uh, I will have uh, another call because uh, after you are novice, and then you uh, getting uh, second class, you have to change uh, your call sign. And, okay. uh, and the um, first class, it is not my goal for now, because it's, uh, I must, uh, I have to know uh, more the code, uh, and uh, I must to um, receive and transmit 60, 60 letters per minute. Uh, and uh, uh, I have not started uh, more the code now, uh, my first goal and uh, it is to be fluent in English uh, and uh, um, ham radio it is a big motivation for this goal. <laughs> yes it is. Uh, well you're doing pretty good, uh, certainly much better than my Russian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of surprised uh, that you guys still require CW. Uh, that completely was dropped from here. Mm -hmm. uh, YLs are a a very small percentage of amateur radio activity here in the United States. Uh, it's growing, fortunately, but uh, and one of the things that I am most proud of is the uh, hamsters, uh, our, our unclub. We've mm -hmm. got quite a few uh, wives, girlfriends, and single women uh, in the group. Uh, are those kind of similar uh, to uh, things in Russia with uh, the low activity of women, or do you find that it's uh, growing over there with more women? Uh, yes, unfortunately, we have the same situation. There are no so many women uh, in our hobby, but I see that uh, some uh, women uh, became more uh, active in the social uh, media with uh, the topics about uh, our uh, hobby. and. It is really very nice, uh, and it is exactly what I do myself. Uh, I want to show that it is not only a technical part of our hobby, and it is very exciting, very interesting. You can learn so much uh, interesting uh, things uh, uh, through the hobby. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in the future, we will have uh, more ladies and more young people uh, in our hobby. And I will be happy if uh, it will be uh, my small part to, uh, to, I don't know how it's, um, if uh, I will be the reason if uh, some of new people uh, will come uh, to our hobby. Yeah, well, I think, uh, think you've done a lot 
to uh, help generate activity and excitement. And you certainly got a lot of followers with it. So, you know, you're, you're doing a great job uh, on that. I do it with great pleasure because uh, I like uh, to share with the people something that I uh, find interesting. Uh, and it is a very pleasure for me uh, to share with people with my hobby. Uh, and uh, when I start uh, my uh, way, when I, after my first crusoe, I immediately decided that I, uh, should be uh, shared with this. It's very interesting. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> well, I, I, I love your videos. Uh, they're, they're fun. Uh, and they don't take themselves seriously. And that's what I like. They're fun uh, and energetic and uh, everything. And you can see your passion and enthusiasm for it. So as a, as a woman, what are some of the obstacles that you've run into getting your license and and taking part in different amateur radio activities uh, i think that uh, it's uh, for example for me i'm not uh, very good in the technical part uh, and uh, it is a problem uh, when you want to pass uh, the exam uh, because you uh, have to know so many very very difficult for me <laughs> I'm not sure, um, maybe uh, for other women, women it is not so difficult, uh, but for me it was uh, quite. Uh, and um, I don't know uh, if the requirements should be easier. I think that uh, there are many very basic and important things that uh, every radio amateur uh, must to know. For example, how to use uh, uh, safety equipment, uh, how to um use uh, no to the frequency which we can use for our hobby uh, and so on but uh, i am not sure that uh, i have uh, to know uh, the circus of the um of the um uh, hit uh, super heterodyne uh, receiver <laughs> i think it's, it's not so important important well, that's 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 good. Yeah, I uh, I agree. Uh, there there's some different aspects that uh, get into the hobby. At one time, we needed some of that knowledge because we built a lot of our own equipment. But today, mm -hmm. hardly anybody builds equipment. It's just not practical with some of the advancements that that we've had on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate you uh, giving us the time, especially with the time difference and coordinating back and forth with us the last week or so. Uh, you brought us a video uh, that you created for us uh, with the uh, Russian phonetics. Uh, what kind of prompted you to make that video? And uh... Uh, the reason was uh, because uh, my um, subscriber uh, asked me uh, about where he can find the Russian phonetic alphabet. And I thought it can be interesting for more hams uh, who want to have uh, a small conversation uh, in Russian with the Russian stations. Uh, and uh, I decided to make this video. Of course, uh, we have uh, an international uh, alphabet uh, which we used for um, our QSO uh, and uh, we will um, continue to use it. But uh, sometimes it's really very pleasure uh, to call um, uh, somebody from the uh, correspondent's native language. And that's why I decided to record this video. And also it can be helpful during contest, uh, cost contests uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. And I hope uh, I will be very happy if uh, someone uh, from your hamsters club uh, will um, find this uh, helpful for themselves, uh, for them, uh, and uh, uh, if uh, they will be use uh, the uh, um, Russian uh, letters with the Russian station, of course. <laughs> well, I, I enjoyed it. And what uh, kind of set me up is is the way we pronounce the same words differently, like uh, Boris for us. Mm -hmm. and you were Boris. 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 Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I found that kind of, those little, those little differences, uh, we're saying the same word, but the way we, we say it differently. 
Yeah. Well, thank and you very I, much. And I can, I can um, say your uh, call sign in Russian, Nikolai, uh -huh. Pet, Znak, Olga. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Okay, well, let's go watch that video that Raisa brought to us, and uh, let's take a look at that. Let's go. The idea to make this video came from my subscriber. They asked me to give an advice how they can find the Russian National Phonetic Alphabet, uh, which will be used in the QSO with Russian radio amateurs. And I decided to make this tutorial video for you. I want to be helpful for my subscribers. Mostly the use for the spelling of the letter Russian female and male names. For example, Alpha, Anna, Anna. Bravo, Boris, Boris. Charnia. It is an interesting case because it's the word is Tsapla. Tsapla. It is a kind of birds. Delta. Dmitri. Dmitri. Echo. Yelena. Yelena. Foxtrot. Fyodor. Fyodor Lvov was the first Russian radio amateur. Golf. Galina. Galina. Hotel. Hariton. Hariton. It is a male name, but very, very rare name. I don't know nobody who has this name. Juliet. Yot. Yot. Or Ivan Kratky, Ivan Kratky, Kilo, Kilowatt, Konstantin, Kilowatt or Konstantin, Lima, Leonid, Leonid, Mike, Mikhail, Mikhail or Maria, Maria, why Maria? <laughs> November. Nikolai, Nikolai, Oscar, Olga, Olga, with the soft pronunciation, the letter L, Olga. My German friends will uh, do it in the right way, I'm sure. Papa, Pavel, Pavel, Quebec, Quebec. Uh, we have known this, uh, this letter in our Russian alphabet. Quebec will be Shuka. Shuka. It is a pike, the fish. Radio. Raman. Raman. Radio. Radio. Or Raisa. <laughs> it is a joke. <laughs> Don't use Raisa. Please use only Raman or Radio. Radio. Sierra, Sergey, Sergey, Tango, Tamara, Tamara, O, Tatiana, Tatiana, Uniform, Ulyana, it is my uh, favorite Russian female name, Ulyana, Victor, Zhuk, Zhuk, it is a beetle, Zhuk, it is a beetle, Whiskey, Vasily, Vasily, X-ray, Znak, Znak, or X, X, Yanke, Y, Y. I think it is simple. Zulo, it is female name Zinaida, Zinaida or. Zoya, the short version of this name, Zoya. Can I continue? Of course, uh, for the QSO, we need the numbers. And the numbers, it's 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 
four, четыре, five, пять, six, шесть, seven, семь, eight, восемь, nine, девять, and десять. I hope it was an interesting video for you. If you like it, please give me your likes and put your comments below. What else can be interesting for you, my friends? And now I would like to offer you a flash mob. Uh, now, after this lesson, you know how uh, to spell your call sign in Russian language. Uh, you can record short video with your call sign with Russian letters uh, and upload it in the stories uh, in Facebook or Instagram. Uh, and don't forget mark my hashtag Vael Raisa. After that, I will repost your stories in my stories and we will have <laughs> a little fun. <laughs> if you like it, of course. Um, let's start. Ulyana, Boria, Adin, Anna, Olga, Anna. 73 and 88. All right. Well, thank you very much, Raisa. Any uh, final words for our uh, audience? And uh, I wish you a uh, nice watching uh, my uh, short video about Russian phonetic alphabet. Uh, and also, uh, I wish you enjoying our hobby. Uh, and uh, hope to see you once more uh, and of course uh, i will be very happy to see uh, you on the air uh, and uh, now then the propagation uh, every day stayed a little bit better uh, we will have more opportunity to have um, QSO with the station with uh, usa uh, and uh, i will be very ha ha happy to have this uh, question <laughs> yeah I'm looking forward to having a QSO on the air with you on 20 or 17 meters sometime too. Yeah, yeah. It Thank will you be very great. much. Thank you very much for joining us and you have a really good evening, I guess. <laughs> Thank you and have a nice day. 73 and 88. <laughs> yeah, 73. All right, over to Melissa now for Show Us Your Shack. All right, let's get started with show us your shacks and don't forget you can send your pics to hamster dash updates at 144200.net and here we have a system from scott w5 sls here we go first we'll note that scott w5 sls operates both hf and vhf uhf weak signal for remote operation, he uses the RSBA1 version 2 software from ICOM. Scott can operate all HF plus 6 meter bands when connected to the IC7300 and 2 meter, 70 centimeter, and 23 centimeter when connected to the IC9700. And that wraps it up for W5SLS. Okay, so let's get started with the new ham corner, and I'm going to be interviewing Miss Renee. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I gotta get my chair. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Miss Renee, K E zero L M Z. Can you tell us what state and what city and state are you talking to us from? By the way. Uh, we are in Warsaw, Missouri right now, but I'm even more rural. I'm from Edwards, Missouri, and you wouldn't even know that it's a town, even if you pass through it. So, uh, Warsaw is a little more of a blip on the map than Edwards is, so. Cool. Okay, so, <clears throat> some of my questions. Besides ham radio, tell us a little bit about yourself and your interests and things that you like to do. Well, I really like writing, and I like world building and I'm into all of that high fantasy extreme sci-fi stuff even though you wouldn't be able to tell if you actually looked at the stuff I read. <laughs> I'm oh, so big into reading and I love video games. I mean <laughs> world building and characters and all of that is just some of my favorite things. Cool. I really like cool. studying dynamics. Okay all right. 
So what got you started in ham radio and why? Uh, the person I push off screen <laughs> is who got me started in ham radio because I'm homeschooled. I've been homeschooled for seven years until I graduated this August. And uh, for science, back when I was 14, mom decided that getting our amateur radio licenses would be a pretty cool science project. Oh, so that's neat. Mom, my brother and I all studied together, going through flashcards and books that we had. Uh, my brother waited until later to get his license because he, he was, he's about two and a half years younger than me, so it kind of just flew over his head at the time. But at the end of the school year, I want to say, uh, mom and I both took the test and we both passed and became technician class life, uh, licensees. Excellent. Excellent. So what kind of challenges did you face uh, in becoming licensed? Did you, did you run into any obstacles? Um, we ran into quite a few obstacles. <laughs> There's many stories I could tell about that, but I'll just stick to uh, one that only made me better at amateur radio, and that is yeah. location. <laughs> because I don't know if you've been to this part of Missouri, but we have lots and lots of hills and lots and lots of rocks. So unless you put your tower and antennas really high, you're not going to get a lot of distance. And uh, we've experienced that a lot in cases where we've had to switch to simplex or we have people just outside the range of the repeater. We've had to figure out the range of the repeater, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So I have to say location definitely one of the biggest challenges we've faced. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you are currently a technician, right? You're just, you're yes, I am a technician class licensee and I'm planning on studying for my general class license, but I'm also trying to do adulting things. So. Okay. Cause that was going to be my next question was, were you planning on advancing at all or was the technician, uh, you know, going to cover your interests? Yes, I do plan on, uh, becoming a general class licensee, but I don't foresee myself becoming an extra class. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, has being involved in amateur radio had any impact on your life? It's had a lot of impact on my life. Um, we'll start with, I got into ham radio immediately into our local Aries group. And from that, I also, uh, got involved in our Region A Healthcare Net. And uh, I've actually been running them more often this year when, you know, conditions permit. It's yeah. also changed uh, a lot. I've become part of the community emergency response team down here, the CERT. Oh. And I wouldn't have done that if I didn't get the foot in the door with Aries. Right. <laughs> and from that, I've also become involved with Camden County Sur, and uh, I've also made a few friends among a bunch of amateur radio clubs throughout Region A. <laughs> so I, I'd say it's had a pretty big impact on my life. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah, um, you know, through the years, amateur radio has helped people either enter a field of work or advance their careers, so uh, I was kind of hoping that the amateur radio was going to play an important role for you, you know, for your future. Excellent. Um, and my, uh, my next question was, um, have you taken a, uh, any part of any radio activities like field days, festivals, competitions and stuff? Yes, I've taken part in a lot of field days. Good, uh, good. Most notably, sometimes we participate with, we participate in field day with the Warrensburg Area Amateur Radio Club Incorporated and Sedalia Pettis Amateur Radio Club. We've also done the simulated emergency test. We've done uh, the, you're familiar with the uh, tornado drill we have in Missouri, right? We've uh, I'm familiar fire. with, the, yeah. We've uh, run nets during that and We've also participated with uh, the American Red Cross, mm -hmm. various mm -hmm. exercises. <laughs> Excellent. 
Excellent. So do your friends know about your amateur radio adventures? Well, all my friends are amateur radio operators. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really interact much with people my age. <laughs> I get along a lot better with people who have their lives together. Because <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to ask if any of your, you know, your, your school friends or, you know, neighborhood friends, if they knew what you were doing on your ham radio. Well, I've been homeschooled since I was 12 and yeah. I live pretty rural, so I don't yeah. really have people near me that are my age. <laughs> So um, the people that you have had contact with, have you tried to get them, you know, into ham? And is there anybody out there that you've actually, you know, uh, asked or actually gotten them into ham radio? Hilariously, I'm actually the public information officer, the PIO of our Aries group. So oh a lot of my interactions <laughs> with people have been telling them about amateur radio yeah. and trying to yeah. get them involved. <laughs> That is something else. Wow, you've been busy. So do you have any final thoughts for our viewers? Um, I want everyone to remember that just because the test is hard, that doesn't mean it's hard to actually be an amateur radio operator. <laughs> it's a lot like what we do over these calls. It's a lot of just talking and rag, rag chewing. Yeah. And even in emergencies, you can still help out even if you uh, yeah. can't help out boots on the ground. Right, right. Wonderful, wonderful. So that will conclude our new Ham Corner segment. Okay, I Greg? have a question for you, Renee. Uh, yeah? What's your favorite part of amateur radio? Well, I got in through the emergency service part, but I have to say that my favorite part is the... Uh, the weekly nets that a bunch of clubs run. They're not exactly emergency training nets. They're a lot closer to rag chewing for most of the clubs. But I gotta say, the weekly nets are always a delight. <laughs> okay. Well, that's Great. a lot of fun. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye now. <laughs> All right. I hope everybody enjoyed our first show and not counting the introduction. I'm sure you watched before this. Uh, we would like to thank all of the people that we had on for our interviews. We really appreciate them taking the time and making the effort to come together with us to make the show something special. What I'd like to do now is go for our final thoughts from each of our hosts. So we'll turn it over to you, Greg, for your final thought. All right. Well, next month, uh, I am planning on a nice product review uh, on the ICOM 9700. So I hope everybody stays, stays tuned for that. Uh, Melissa, you got anything? I don't have anything. I'm just trying to get moved and packed and unpacked. And I have a lot of work on the side. So I'm a little busy at the moment. Yeah, I'll bet uh, moving <laughs> and trying to do this at the same time is rather convenient. We have to say, this is definitely a unique effort. I've been invited on other shows and done other little videos and everything, but I love the idea of coming together and doing a consistent show that we're going to do each month. And we're going to try and come up with some really interesting and unique things, including interviews, because to me, reaching out, and I'm sure to Greg and Melissa as well, reaching out to our own community right here from people you wouldn't normally hear from is one of the best things that we can do. We'd like to thank you all for joining us for this month's show. We are super excited about December's show, so make sure that you come back to us. Uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel or even our mailing list. Greg, do you have that information for us? Yeah, uh, you can uh, reach out to everything on www.144200.net or email me direct at n5xo at 144200.net. So that ought to be easy for everybody to remember. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next month. <laughs>